afternoon, everyone. Please can I ask the technical support to start the live stream and to give me verbal confirmation when that's happening. Uh, before we formally start the meeting, I'll go to each councillor present in turn to confirm that they can hear and be heard. This is a legal requirement for virtual meetings. Where practicable, please also have your video switched on so that you can be seen by those in attendance and the public watching. So in order, first of all, um, Councillor Chowns. No, we can't, we can't hear you, Councillor Chowns. Apologies, my space bar trick wasn't working. I can intermittently see and hear you fine. Thank you, Councillor Chance. Councillor Harvey? Yes, I can uh, see and hear you. Thank you. Councillor James? Yes, I can see and hear you. Uh, and Councillor Johnson is uh, not available. Um, Sarah, do we have uh, any indication if he's joining us? I've not received any apologies, uh, okay. Chair, so uh, he, he may be yeah. on his way. Okay. Uh, we also have present the following officers, Tracy Sampson, who is Assistant Director for People, Caroline Marshall, Clark to the panel, and Sarah Braffery, Technical Support. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel, and also making an official recording. The recording forms part of the public record of the meeting and will be available via the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Please remember that what you say and do in this meeting has a global reach and your words and actions should be chosen carefully. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, please keep background noise to a minimum. The microphone should be muted when you are not speaking and please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. If any attendee loses connection, the meeting will be paused to ascertain if the connection can be restored quickly. If it is not possible to recover the connection within a reasonable period of time, the meeting will continue as long as quorum of panel members remains able to hear proceedings and be heard. Where panel members are required to vote on an item, we will be using electronic voting. If a panel member has not been present for the whole of the discussion on an item due to the technical failure, they should not vote on that item. Thank you. I will now formally open the meeting. On the agenda, item one is apologies for absence. Have any apologies been notified? No apologies have been notified to us, but Councillor Johnson is not present. Thank you. Uh, any name substitutes? There are no name substitutes. And item three, to declare declarations of interest in respect of Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or other interests from members of the panel in respect of items on the agenda. Are there any Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or other interests uh, for items on the agenda today? I hear none. Uh, minutes, the item four, to approve and sign the minutes of the meeting held on 27th of October. Uh, no matters of accuracy have been notified, so I will ask the panel members to confirm that they agree the minutes by an electronic vote. Um, if you would please bring up the electronic voting screen. And members should then vote for or against, uh, and then the submit button. And if you could then confirm the number of votes cast, that would be helpful. Thank you. There were four eligible members present to vote and it was, and the minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, item five, uh, questions from members of the public. Um, there are none. Uh, questions from councillors, it's item six. There are no questions there either. So we move on then to item seven, which is to recommend the 2021 pay policy statement to full council for approval and publication. Uh, the uh, assistant director people um, 
Uh, Tracy, I don't know whether you'd like to uh, uh, address this particular item. Okay. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, so it's a requirement of the Localism Act that the Council publishes a statement which sets out its approach to pay. It's important to underline that the policy in itself does not change how we do things. It is a statement of what is already in place. The role of employment panel, as you've mentioned, is to recommend the policy to full council and it will be considered at full council at its meeting in February. And afterwards, the statement will be published on the council's website. There are no significant changes in the policy since it was brought last year. It has been updated. Um, and based on feedback I received at this meeting last year, I've continued to report the ratio between the highest and lowest paid and show how that compares with other local authorities, which I've included in the report. And you'll notice from the report that the council's ratio is amongst the lowest. In fact, I think it's the lowest for um, all our councils around us, apart from Powys. And I've also just included a bit more information about how market supplements are managed in the council. Um, and I've included the review dates, which were specifically requested last year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any, uh, any questions on, on this report or comments? I, we did comment on it last year and uh, Tracy, thank you for introducing those, uh, those new elements. That's most helpful. Um, Councillor Chowns. Thanks, yes. Um, thank you, Tracy. A couple of um, questions about that. So it's really useful to see the salary ratio. Um, thank you. Um, and I'm encouraged that our ratio is, is lower than um, um, most of the other authorities that you've listed. Um, but it's unchanged. And I wonder if, I mean, I would like us as a council to be aiming towards becoming a council with a lower ratio between lowest and highest paid, primarily by increasing the pay of those at the lowest rung. And I wonder if there is anything that we are doing or considering doing to, to address that so that we're on a trajectory towards greater equity. And uh, I note that that's in line with the central government's levelling up agenda. Um, and the second question is about the... Um, uh, what, what are we calling them? The supplement, the market forces supplements. It's really useful to see that laid out. Um, and um, in cases where a post becomes vacant before the due date for review, it, so is the supplement sort of attached to the person who happens to be in that post at the time, or is it a, a supplement that's permanently attached to that post? And how are these worked out? Is there a national system for market forces supplements for certain types of harder to fill jobs? Can you shed some light on that, please? Thanks. Um, so if it's okay, Chair, I'll reply. Um, yes, please. Yeah. On the first issue about the lowest points, this is tricky because we've got a nationally determined pay scale. Um, so we, we follow the national pay scheme and that applies to both the chief execs pay and the pay at the very bottom, certainly when it comes to pay increases. Um, and what makes this extra tricky is that the chief execs pay scales tend to be identical um, pay increases tend to be identical to those for the rest of the main body pay scale. So, for instance, this year they all went up by 2.75 percent, which is why they are the same proportion as they were last year. So if we want to decrease that ratio, we've got two choices. Well, actually, we've got a third choice, which is to move away from the nationally um, approved pay bodies. Um, the two choices we've got is that we can, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Chance, were you waving? Oh, sorry. Well, I didn't particularly mean to interrupt you, but if it's oh. nationally pay scales, why is there a difference between councils? Sorry, Nash, um, my apologies. Um, uh, pay bodies who determined the pay increases that are applied each year. So there isn't a set pay rate for a chief executive as such, but, but if you are attached to the national pay bargaining system, which we are, then they will increase by the same amount each year in every council, if that makes sense. So what we can do if we want to reduce it is we could um, make a proposal to full council to change the chief exec salary downwards. And I know we've covered that in a different meeting or we could eliminate pay grades at the bottom of our pay scale. Those essentially would be our two options. 
And there are all sorts of factors behind those two things, but those are essentially our choices if we want to reduce that ratio and compress the pay scale down. Is it okay if I move on to the market forces supplement? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the market forces supplement, um, they're attached to the post rather than the person. So if the person moved on to a different job, the market forces supplement wouldn't necessarily follow them, probably wouldn't follow them. There are some posts I am very confident that whoever is in that post will attract a market forces supplement. So for instance, our um, so children's social workers, most of our market forces supplements are in children's social work. And whoever we appoint into those roles, that market forces supplement is going to um, continue for as long as we've got the market forces supplement problem we've got. Um, when you get, I think, to some of the posts that we've got listed on the senior management structure, I think the situation is perhaps different um, because it, it's a more nuanced recruitment process. And sometimes we will have to pay a bit more to get a particular candidate. Um, but we will only do that if the market conditions provide us the evidence that we should be paying it. So for instance, we will benchmark and see whether or not we are paying below um, or in, a, in, in accordance with the national pay rates for that role. We'll never give a market forces supplement if the information comes back and says, actually, you know, you're paying there or thereabouts. There, there isn't a pay issue with this role. Um, and I think we've got another item on the agenda later, which shows where we're looking at a post where there is currently a market forces supplement. And I'm going to put a suggestion to you that that doesn't continue. Um, so I think what I'm saying is that it isn't automatic, that it will always carry on. We, we think about these things really carefully. Nobody loves market forces supplements. We want to keep them um, to the absolute minimum. And I'd say um, outside of children's social work, I think in total, we've got fewer than 10 in total. Okay. Uh, Councillor James. Yeah, well, it, it, how things have changed and market, um, market supplements have changed. 20 years ago, I mean, the bulk of those um, uh, supplements were in the IT area. And it, it's, you know, some of them were substantial um, in, uh, increments that were had to be added to encourage people that are necessary. That has changed to a large extent. And I, I, I don't know when you say there are only 10 outside of uh, children's services. Are those still in IT or has that uh, finally been sort of sorted? Um, Councillor James, um, none of the IT posts are employed by Herefordshire Council, so we don't have any market forces Sorry. supplements there. Um, no, they're in Hoople now. Yeah. So the ones but, that we've I mean, got, apologies. We ultimately pay, but the, I think, you know, that has, that has not, that, that, that market force is not the same as it was 20 years ago, 10, 10 and let alone 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter in the end because we have to pay it anyway, if it's Hoople or ourselves, ultimately. Mm. So I guess that's a separate issue, isn't it? Um, not, not, not for this committee, really. Councillor James, do you have any other observations at the moment? No, I just think you know. Um, I don't think there's any any anything that uh, needs to be added to what's been in the report. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Chowns. Thank you, um, uh, and thanks for that clarification earlier, Tracy. Um, another question, which is just. Could you clarify for me, um, so, so there isn't reference to gender in this report on pay policy. Um, we have to report on gender pay gap, don't we? Do we have any, do we have a separate policy on eliminating the gender pay gap? How come that's not referenced in this document? Okay, so this document includes those items that are required in the Localism Act, so we've kept it quite tight. The gender pay gap um, and the action plan associated with the gender pay gap um, gets reported in January. It's just a different time scale and a different process. Um, now, if you're making a request for me to join up the two in future, oh, of course, we can always consider that, yeah, if that's what you'd prefer. I can link them. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, op I'm open to discussion on it, but that it would seem to me that would make sense, right? So the Localism Act was earlier than the gender pay gap legislation. It was. But they're both, they're both about pay policy, or they both have, have, have relevance to pay policy. So it would seem to me to, to make sense to link, link that all together. Yep, we can do that very easily. Thank you. If that's agreeable to everyone else on the panel. I suppose it's just a matter of uh, what items there are to cover during the whole year uh, and whether the employment panel just wants to meet uh, less often, which could could be the consequence of putting putting it uh, together. Councillor Sampson, how, how often, uh, sorry, um, Tracy, how often do, do this, does this panel normally meet in a year? Um. I, I'm not sure we've got a recognised pattern. I think the thing that brings us here most is when we've got senior appointments to make, but perhaps maybe four or five times a year. Um, I would say, though, that the gender pay gap doesn't get reported at this committee. So if we include it in the pay policy statement, that is a way to bring it here. I don't think it would affect how often you meet. Mm -hmm. It would just give some visibility to the gender pay gap at this meeting. OK. Does anybody have a particular view as to whether it should be this committee or another time? Okay, well, let's, let's all have can it I, all together. Can I, Fine. Can I just say something? I, think yeah, it be, I just think it should be included in this committee and other committees. But I, the point I, I should have made when I last spoke was the fact that mm -hmm. the, 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 the gap mm -hmm. is exasperated in real terms as time goes on. If, if we adopt the national pay, as Councillor Chan said about the concern about the, the gap and trying to reduce it, even though we're one of the better councils, if what you know, if somebody's on a hundred thousand and they get a two point seven seven percent rise, they get two thousand seven hundred pounds extra income. Uh, if they're on ten thousand, they get two hundred and seventy pounds. Now that that um, over years, really in real terms, the mm -hmm. the, the, the gap widens, mm -hmm. and the, the, the doesn't seem to be anything done to do. To I know there's national policy about the national living wage, etc., but um, you know, I think in real terms, the, the, the gap has widened everywhere, not just in, not just in other councils, but in our council. Well, we'll uh, we'll see when we look at it. Uh, can, uh, Tracy, were you going to comment on that? Yes, uh, I think it was the year before last. Um, we actually had a new pay scale introduced um, by the NJC. And that did um, address pay scales at the bottom of the pay scale, all the pay points. And in some cases, there were increases of up to, I think it was 11 or 12% at the bottom of the pay scale. And that was about two years ago. And that piece of work was there to make sure that the pay spine points at the bottom of the pay scale comply with the national minimum wage, because there was a danger that they wouldn't. So there has been some recent activity nationally to address pay at the bottom of the pay scale. Okay, um, Councillor Harvey. Although my recollection of the um, the, the analysis of um, gender and pay is that the majority of our least well-paid workers are women. It was something like three quarters of them were women, and only a quarter were were men. So. Um, that there was kind of a reverse gender pay gap at the at the bottom because there were so few men employed so it's quite a it's quite a complicated picture to to analyze and to think about um and i think you know having a having it rep reported here is good but i think we also need to be considering what the genuine actions are that um that that work to to narrow it um, and how those align with what people actually want in their lives because some people do actually want to take career breaks when they have families um, and feel that 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 that's the right thing for them and although it does exacerbate a gender pay gap where the people taking the career break are are the mums um if that's what 
they want. I wouldn't want to be putting measures in place that close the gender pay gap by making it more difficult for people to take career breaks when they start families. So, I mean, as long as we acknowledge that it is a complicated picture and the reason why we've got gender pay gap is about partly about people's personal choices, um, we, we just need to be cognizant of that in, in thinking about what the right things are to do to give people um, the flexibility to choose for themselves what they do in their, their own personal lives and with their families. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, any other questions, observations? Um, Councillor Harvey, I don't know whether your suggestion there means that there ought to be a, another item somewhere on the agenda to, to discuss that point generally about flexibility, and, um, uh, lifestyle choices and that kind of thing. But uh, does the council do a reasonable job with that sort of offering, uh, Tracy, do you think? I've got two answers to that. I think that we've got really good provision and coverage and the policies are all there. Um, what I couldn't tell you is that how well they're applied consistently and that's an honest answer. Hmm. So the, yeah, the tools are there, but if somebody applies and wishes to change their working hours, um, I couldn't, uh, well, obviously the answer isn't always going to be yes. And, and do we get many people asking or is it just something which is nice to have and people actually don't, don't. Um, oh, no. It, it's popular, is it? Yeah. Really popular. We've got um, a wide variety of working arrangements. I think generally they're well supported and well covered. I think we recognise that you've got to be flexible if you want good people working for you. Mm -hmm. And has COVID and working from home had any impact on that? Um, I don't know yet. Um, mm. I, th I mean, I know we've we've had um, a staff survey about how people are working during COVID, which told us that um, I think it was something like over 70% felt able to manage their lives better working mm. from home. And at the same time, they felt more productive. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the signs are really positive. Um, we also, we're, we're working on just a really basic concept of managing people by outcomes rather than input. Mm. What have you actually produced, which is essentially what we need um, and our survey told us that staff felt that they were actually being managed by outcomes which is where we've been trying to get to for some time. Do we, do we feel that people are uh, for instance uh, the man who's working from home goes and picks his children up in the afternoon and, and then makes up the time later in the day is that the sort of thing that's happening? I would have thought yeah exactly um, where the business allows, because sometimes you do have to be in front of your screen, screen at specific times. Mm -hmm. But for most of us, we've got that flexibility. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Chowns. Thanks. Um, is there a, a, um, a, a specific time of year or a specific report where we this panel would get a report on, for example, what percentage of our employees are you know, using flexible working arrangements, as in part-time working arrangements. Um, so that's one question. And, and if not, could we have one? And the other one is, um, it, while, while this report that we're looking at today tells us about how many people we've got at the top end of the, 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 the pay spine, do we have any report, any regular report looking at the kind of the, the structure of the organisation in terms of how many people at the higher end or the lower end are within particular areas of it, how that has changed over time? Have we got a way of kind of understanding the patterns in terms of the, the sort of, you know, the, the visuals, the chart of whether we're top heavy or bottom heavy in particular areas, for example? You're asking for a How workforce report. Sorry? You're asking for a workforce report. 
um, which um, we don't actually report to this committee. I mean, assuming the chair has no problem with that, that's information that I've got access to fairly easily. It isn't something that I provide to this committee and haven't in the past. Um, but if that's wanted, it's available. I, th I think I think it's, it'd be quite interesting to uh, to see see what sort of trend to understand a little bit more about the uh, the, the uh, employment um, landscape. Yeah. Um, what do other other members of the committee think, Councillor James? Do you have a particular view on that? If it's readily available, why not uh, look at it? Mm -hmm. Councillor Harvey, are you happy with that? Well, I believe it goes, um, does it go to audit and governance, the, the workforce report? The staff survey certainly goes, goes there. Um, but uh, it, which, which is it, which committee is it that, uh, that takes a look at that or does it not go to a committee? I don't produce a general workforce report for any committee. I've, let's, let's be having it then. Okay, <laughs> that's easy. Um, and certainly in terms of distribution of staff across the grades, I get that information. So yeah, that's really easy to provide. And do I take the survey report then? The survey report goes to audit and governance. This is about workforce survey. Oh. So why does that go to audit and governance and not come to the employment panel? I do. It seems to me more relevant for it to go to employment, and unless it's a, unless it's a big risk that's identified on the audit and governance committee, because we probably don't even have a risk risk register for this committee, do we? Is that again asking too much? Not not particularly relevant. I don't know. Maybe if there's an if there's a risk register for the audit and governance committee. Uh, elements of that which relate to employment, perhaps we should be looking at those on this committee. Anybody? And if I may add something, well? Lido, because I'm the clerk to the Audit and Governance Committee. Mm -hmm. So the um, Audit and Governance Committee receive the Corporate Risk Register and the Directorate Risk Registers. I believe as part of those risk registers, they are checking for assurances that our governance processes and structures are accurate. I believe those risk registers are also reported through to cabinet and that specific risks can be picked up and discussed by the cabinet. So audit and governance are looking for assurance. The ownership of the actual risk sits with the executive and obviously the management board. Okay. Um, Tracy, I'll pick that up separately, separately if I may. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Any any other questions, or should I put this to the to the vote? Okay. Um, so the recommendation to the panel is as follows: that the pay policy statement at Appendix A is recommended to full council. Again, if you could bring up the uh, voting. Um, Bertie card, that would be helpful. Uh, so if you care to vote for, against or abstain and submit. All eligible members have voted and the recommendation has been passed unanimously. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so we then move on to the next item. Uh, which, uh, uh, and this is uh, one where we um, we ex uh, I think of excluding the press and the public uh, because in the opinion of the proper officer, <clears throat> the next item will not be or is likely not to be open to the public and press at the time it is considered. And the recommendation is that under Section 100 A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in Schedule 12A of the Act, and it is considered that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. This report discloses information relating to an individual. So, um, uh, do I then put that to the 
vote or does it automatically happen that um, the discussion, yes, we may need to make a decision as to whether it's to be in private. Yes, Chair, you do need, the panel do need to vote, <coughs> vote on it and resolve to meet in private. Thank you, thank you, Caroline. Do we have a voting slip for that or do we do it um, uh, by voice or hand? You can do it um, on the voices for this particular one, Chair. Okay, so, um, Councillor Chairs, uh, for or against? For. Councillor Harvey? Or did you have a question before we went put it there? Well, yes, I did have my hand up. Um, is, is it not possible to talk about doing this without discussing specific individuals? Uh, Tracy. The, the purpose of the discussion is to discuss the individuals, the plan for the individual. I don't know the answer to that, Councillor Harvey, I'm afraid, until we get into the discussion. Um, might I ask a question of the chair and of the clerk? Would that be OK? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Caroline, could I just ask if we had the discussion in public uh, along the lines of um, what Councillor Harvey has just suggested, would that make the associated documents public? Because that would be my major concern. <clears throat> no, it wouldn't. The exemption, if it names an individual, the exemption would still remain in place. If the panel can agree how they're going to discuss the item in public. So, for example, referring to the interim as opposed to naming an individual, then it may be possible for this item to be discussed in public. Okay, because I can't see in the report where anybody is named. I'm just asking. So we, we can go ahead with it in public, provided no names. Uh, she, uh, the person is named in the report, please chat. David. Yes, I, I can't you. Ellie, yeah. Oh, in, in the appendix, yes, but not in the report. My reading of the report is that there is only one individual who is in the role referred to in the report, and therefore that individual is effectively named yep. through discussion. Is there not a, a right. quite a press, I mean, it's not that this is very controversial, is it? Is it not just that there's a precedent of not discussing? individuals in, in public we didn't do it when with the previous matter so I, i'd be content to continue with that precedent okay it's going to if it's going to sort of tie us from having a um a proper discussion about this then i'm happy to i'm happy to go with it but you know i'd I hate sticking things in private sessions, so I needed to ask the question. No, I think it's a very fair challenge, um, but I think it might uh, limit our conversation a little bit. So uh, okay. um, just just maybe in the future, we could just check. Um, and if we are able to exclude people's names, then, then do that. So uh, are we content for it to be uh, held in private? Uh, cast the chance for or against? You've already voted for, I think. Councillor Harvey. For. Uh, Councillor James. For. Uh, and I'm for as well. So uh, then I think the live stream temporarily stops. Don't name that post in that recommendation. Okay, it talks about um, uh, receiving public health consultant is temporarily appointed. It doesn't actually say what post they've currently got, actually. Oh, no, it does, I suppose, if she's the only public health consultant. Yeah, if you could just uh, miss out the words public health. So the meeting is now streaming live, or do I wait for a voice? Um, thank you very much. Welcome back to uh, to everyone. So we've had a, 
a discussion and now the recommendation uh, following that discussion is, is part of this live recording. And the recommendation of the panel is as follows, that subject to approval from the Advisory Appointment Committee, the AAC, and subject to there being no valid objections received from cabinet members by 9 a.m. on Friday, 20th, 20th of November, the individual about whom we've been uh, having our discussion is temporarily appointed for up to 12 months to the role of Director of Pu Public Health. Um, I now ask panel members to vote on the recommendation using the uh, voting slip. And uh, Caroline, if you could let us know the result, that would be good. Uh, all members have now voted and that resolution has been unanimously carried. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now um, close the meeting. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Can the technical support confirm that the live stream and the recording 